Okay, so welcome everyone to the February edition of the Uni Community Hours. Uh, in this case, it's almost a hack week edition because as you can see on the agenda, we have a lot of topics related to the hack week. If you don't know what the hack week is, you can have a look at the last two Uni Community Hours because there we explain what this is about and how you can participate for next time. But yeah, I'm going to briefly present uh, what is going to be new with the Uni 2023. 302 or 03, we still don't know when we are going to release. Avid will be presenting the uni roadmap and then four hack week projects. Raul and myself will be presenting the new operating systems that we added as clients for uni. I will be presenting how to build the documentation on any operating system with no tool chain at all. Then Pablo will show us improvements on the uni health check tool. And finally, Cedric will tell us how he was able to deploy the UniProxy container with Fleet and Elemental. So let's get right into it. So, well, as I already mentioned, it is still not clear to, to us if we are going to be able to release the an Uni version on February. If that is not possible, then we will release it as soon as possible on the first days of March. So that is the reason you see both versions here. But in any case, what is going to be new there? OpenSUSE Leap Micro 5.3 is going to be supported as client, and this is part of the presentation that Raul and myself will do later. We are enabling new products, in this case, OpenSUSE Leap 15.5 and SUSE Linux Enterprise 15 SP5. Both products are still beta, so not ready for production, but you can already tried them on a uni. There is an update of Grafana to version 8.5.15. It contains only security fixes, but we recommend that as soon as we make this available, you update. Now with this new version of a uni, syncing optional channels from the web user interface is going to be possible. And this is something that is going to be presented in the next month in the uni community, community hours, because we we had so many requests for presenting things that the agenda for March is already full, so you can have a look at the website. Then the subscription warning notifications that those of you with uh, SEC accounts know. Well, you are getting, if you have any subscription that is expiring, you are getting a daily email. Now this is going to change to be sent to the users only week but of course you will still get the, the information on the web UI. And then finally, SOL 3000 comes to its end of life, but that doesn't mean we are not going to support the clients that were using it, namely SLE 12 and CentOS 7. Those are still supported, but from now on, only with the SOL bundle. So you will need to migrate those clients to the SOL bundle. And then Debian, Nine is end of life for us. Uh, it's end of life since, if I recall correctly, June last year. So after some time still supporting it, now we mark it as, as it, it means, of course, that you can still manage the Debian 9 for some time more. But if there is something broken, we will not break anything on purpose, but we will not keep the compatibility on purpose as well. And those are the news for the upcoming version. So we have time, time for some questions, if you have any. Okay. And in that case, the next presenter is Avid. So go ahead. Avid will tell us about the Uyuni roadmap. Thank you, Leo. Let me share my slides. Oh. I believe you should be able to see my slides now, right? Yes. Okay, so yeah, hi everyone. Um, welcome again from my side too. Good to have some folks after quite some time in the meeting. Uh, so yeah, as mentioned in the last uh, community hours that yeah, we were planning to present some roadmap to you folks that what we are doing, what we are planning to do, 
and uh, that's this presentation is about. I will. I won't be going in detail because, as you say, I, as you already saw, that there are quite a few topics that we want to cover, and we need to make sure that yeah, those folks also get enough time. Before proceeding to the roadmap part, we need to know that yeah, what we want to achieve, and when it comes to uni. Uh, we would like to, you know, make Uni the best toolbox available out there to update, configure, and audit the Linux layer um, that is underneath uh, the application, and that needs to happen in a predictable and automatable way. While doing this, we also need to make sure that yeah, Uni is distro agnostic, location agnostic, and open source, uh, which is the yeah, core of uh, our uh, our values. So that's vision statement, and now we would like to, you know, move to the next part, which is like uh, really uh, the roadmap, uh, which actually is really a description that how we intend to achieve this product vision. Uh, of course, it focuses on the value uh, uh, that we propose to deliver, uh, and uh, uh, and that's the whole point of this. Again, yeah, uh, there are many different definitions, but I won't be going the definition. I guess pretty uh, pretty much everyone understands what uh, it does uh, really mean. So what we are currently doing, um, yeah, there are a couple of disclaimers. Sorry, I will go back to the slide. A couple of disclaimers here before I move to the next slides. Uh, the content of this document is really, you know, roadmaps are meant to be changed. We continuously evaluate the situation, uh, the requests, uh, how the market is moving, and then we react accordingly. Uh, sometimes, sometimes, yeah, they are more the kind of stretch decisions, and yeah, uh, that's how we take it. But we reserve the rights to change that, uh, whatever we present next, uh, and they could change any any time um, we feel that yeah, they are required. The next part uh, or the next disclaimer, which is not listed here, is that yeah, you will see that yeah, some some of those bullet points they are easy to map to a feature and easy to understand, but some of them are not really feature uh, in a sense. They are kind of bigger topics, bigger theme, uh, and that they will have uh, a lot of other features included in that. So here, yeah, uh, some of them, as I mentioned, yeah, will be at a very abstract level, and uh, they include a lot more changes than I would be able to explain it here, or that we could uh, add into one particular issue. So they are not features, but uh, they are combination of a lot of things that need to happen in order to achieve that bullet point. And then there are some easy one uh, that uh, were very easy to, you know, uh, make sense of, and um, they could actually map one to one to a feature. So uh, currently, what we are doing. So and uh, again, yeah, uh, when I say current, I mean uh, estimately we we think that yeah, then over the next cup uh, next six months around, that's the rough uh, window that I uh, assume here. This is the topics or the bigger topics that we will be taking care of. Uh, there will be still some smaller changings here and there, uh, some requests from community, some other features that we think that yeah, are low hanging fruits and that they will uh, get in. But most of our efforts will be focused on these main points. Uh, containerization, why? Um, mostly because yeah, uh, we want to make sure that yeah, Uni is able to run in container and only environment. Uh, which will also make it independent uh, from the base OS. So you don't need uh, any particular OS uh, to make use of Uni. That's one thing. Also, it would make development and CI easier. Um, and then uh, one thing is that, yeah, it would also allow us to install us uh, on top uh, on top of, uh, you know, any uh, Kubernetes distribution. In this case, we are currently testing on RKE2. And just uh, 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 an hour ago, yeah, uh, <laughs> and we got the message from Cedric that yeah, he was able to, you know, first, uh, he was able to bootstrap the first system from the UI of uh, a uni running in RK2. So a lot of good experimentation is going on. It will it will be um, not just you know as I mentioned that yeah uh, it, it's a kind of umbrella term, but there are a lot of changing that we need to do. It's not straightforward to move from uh, this monolith application that we have and then yeah, start running it in containerization. There will be a lot of refactoring will be needed. There will be some easy components that will containerized, but then there will be a lot of complex that would probably need you know, some kind of re uh, rewrite. And only then we will be able to uh, write that. We have a complete uh, uh, detailed uh, roadmap around this particular topic. And yeah, this effort is uh, it's a big one. Uh, 
uh, and uh, we could we could also yeah, you know share that plan as well if anybody would be interested but yeah containerization in one of the, one of the topic that we need to take care of uh then yeah automation is you know uh, i guess um and we really think that yeah automation is where uni could do much better than we currently are so it provides pretty good api uh, now http api as well but still there are some missing pieces and customer need, uh, or, or the user need to do some cron jobs and all this stuff to automate all that part we want to fix that thing. We already have like recurrent for high states, but we need to extend that thing. And uh, now the thing that we want to handle is really, you know, add that um, for the states, for the normal states. Once that, but we want to design it in a way that yeah, we could also extend it to the other parts of the product. That means open scap. That means um, this uh, in CLM promoting and building projects, you know, to to make it easier for, for the user uh, to make use of Uni and you know the daily. Uh, task that they perform on the, on a daily basis, uh, so they are uh, you know easily manageable. Modernized tech stack, you know this is very uh, kind of related to containerization as well. But yeah, we started this uh, particular um, uh, topic separately, but it, it 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 will it will cross at some moment with a containerization effort. So you know some of the things that are uh, running in Spacewalk or <laughs> our uni. Uh, are really old and we need to you know get rid of them we need to migrate them there are some and it goes both ways like there are some visible changing and some invisible uh, when i say invisible uh, I, I i'm mentioning like the bootstrap framework for example that we need to upgrade we are still on running bootstrap uh, bootstrap framework 3 and we need to uh, the current one is five and that's where we want to be uh, then another thing that will be coming in like some of the pages that we have out there for example system list page um it's 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 uh, when you know we have a lot of systems uh it it's not very um you know user friendly i would say or it's not as performant as it should be so we are rewriting th that page for example you probably yeah you are already aware of that so we have something there there are a couple of issues we will be fixing but that won't be the only page you know there will be some other pages as well that we will be working on um move to the next point yeah uh open scap support uh currently yeah you know it's not very user friendly, I would say, and we want to improve that open scap support that we have in in Uni. Uh, there are quite a few changes that need to happen. Uh, it ranges from usability to how we consume uh, remote content and like uh, where the actual content should be stored. Currently, everything is needs to be present in the client, but we want to change that and we want to make sure that the uh, the content at the end only needs to exist at Uni server, and then we will use it uh, at the runtime, move to the client, execute all the uh, runs, and then yeah, get back the results, and that's it. So that's another thing that we want to improve. Of course, SALT, uh, one of the pillar uh, under UNI that is running, we need to upgrade. So the current SALT 3004 uh, will be end of life, and yeah, we need to upgrade, uh, and that's another thing. It's a big one change, as you know. It's a big one, so it needs a lot of testing. Uh, so it's absolutely deserve uh, a bullet point here. So yeah, that will be uh, uh, another thing. As I mentioned, yeah, uh, um, uh, destroy agnostic, but yeah, here you see our products, but we will see if there will be another LTS version from Ubuntu Debian, which I don't expect. We will be working on them as well. But for the next six months, uh, these are three products that we think that yeah, we will be adding in Uni. That includes Azure Linux Enterprise 15 SP5, uh, the corresponding Leap version 15.5, and also Sli Micro 5.3 support. So yeah, that was about the current things that are going on. There are a few smaller things as well. But yeah, uh, I only you know uh, focused on on the main topics. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can ask now. Otherwise, I will move to the next slide, which is like kind of predicting the future. Okay, good. I will move to the next slide then. Uh, so uh, uh, yeah, once we are done, uh, not completely done because some of the features I mentioned, the containerization is taking much much longer than than the six months. So. We expect that yeah, it's it's going to be um, an effort that will take years. So containerization will be again the topic that we will be handling. Hub improvements. Uh, you know that yeah, uh, in Uni, you we provide this. Uh, we um, the term is actually a bit confusing. So we have this uh, hub initiative where you know have Uni of Uni. So Uni can manage another Uni, uh, other Uni servers. 
And there are, uh, we have in uh, some ex uh, XML RPC API around it to you know manage everything from the Uni server uh, or the hub server, Uni hub server. <laughs> and then you know we also provide some uh, inter-server sync version two to um, uh, transfer content. We uh, but all of these are you know um, CLIs and it's not very user friendly. Uh, we have identified some parts and so we want to improve uh, something around that. So it's they are more user friendly and they are easy to consume. So that's one thing that we would like to tackle. ALP is coming um, next year uh, in fall, uh, actually this year, uh, not the next year. We are already in 2023. So in fall 2023, we will be having the ALP. So and uh, we plan to add ALP support in uni as well. Um, there will be improved Ansible integration. This is a request that came multiple times from community. And uh, yeah, we'll be finally getting hands on this one as well. There are quite a few things that uh, that are listed there uh, in our backlog, and we will be tackling some of them at least um, uh, over, over, over the next year. Uh, live view on action in progress. Yeah, this is a nice uh, small feature. You know, when, for example, we do some product migration or some task uh, action that takes a lot of time, we don't really give feedback, you know, it's one or zero. So unless it's completed, only then you get something that, yeah, OK, this is done. We want to improve that. For example, the action that takes a lot of time, we want to make sure that, yeah, we kind of give some feedback back to the user to their where, the, where we are at the moment and how long it's going to take for that action. We will see. Uh, yeah, so that's another uh, thing that we want to tackle. And as I mentioned before, uh, in the last slide, we had this recurring state. Uh, we want to design this thing in a way that yeah we could extend it and yeah the next thing after uh, recurring state that we are going to tackle is um, make sure that yeah we could run open scap scans uh, on a recurrent basis in an automated uh, automatable way and yeah that's we think uh, that's where we think that yeah is going to add uh, quite much value. So yeah, this was actually yeah uh, I hope I didn't take a lot of time so this is more or less the roadmap of uni. Uh, and what we are going to do over the next six months and the year. In fact, again, if you have any questions, happy to answer. Can you share some additional details about what the advanced Ansible integration will look like? Any are there any mockups, any UI um, ideas you could share? Uh, one thing that we want to tackle, you know, we have this uh, formula with forms and we want to have something similar for the Ansible playbooks as well. Uh, we will be looking into Ansible roles and Ansible collections as well and see. But uh, again, yeah, nor, uh, we don't haven't evaluated in detail. These are some of the main points that we want to tackle and we will be sharing, of course, uh, once we will have more detail. But currently, as uh, it's uh, as you saw that, yeah, it's still something that will be coming probably yeah, after six months. So we haven't um, gone much into detail, but these are some things that we would like to tackle. This is awesome because this is the uh, request I get every time I use Uyuni for customers. They say, hey, salt formulas look nice, but I want to have this for Ansible roles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. To have some feedback from the customers, just let me know. I'm doing this quite often, and this is the most requested feature I can tell you. Perfect, perfect. No, absolutely. We depend a lot on feedback from you folks, and yeah, it, this is going to be great. Yeah, I, I'll show sure ping you. Awesome. I, I I had an issue that I created. I just um, posted the URL in the chat. Um, so I think we can close this after this feature is going forwards. <laughs> Cool. Thanks a lot for the effort. Highly appreciated. Everything. Everything. Okay. Any other questions? Otherwise, we will move to the cool part, the technical one. <laughs> okay. Doesn't seem to be okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> strictly speaking, the next part is going to be a, a bit of roadmap as well as. Okay. You can see because we are going to talk about part of the things that Abby just described. It. So let's go for it. I'm going to try to share the screen again if I can find the button. Oh, here it is. Uh, oh no, sorry. Wrong thing. Bear with me, please. One moment. So here we go. Slide, hack week, new distributions as, as clients for uni. 
Okay, so uh, very briefly, this is one of the Hack Week projects that uh, from SUSE we did during, during the Hack Week 20 uh, edition number 22. In this, in this case, Raul and myself were working together to bring some new operating systems or some versions of existing operating systems to Uyuni. And well, with this, Raul, you can go ahead and tell us about the improvements for OpenOila. Uh, thank you, Julio. So the first operating system I would like to talk about is OpenOila. And actually, if you were in the previous Uyuni community meeting, uh, after the hack week, and uh, this is rather some open oil uh, revisited because the support was uh, already implemented in the previous hack week. There were some issues with the repositing that were already solved, and everything was working pretty well. Uh, but uh, when I was retesting uh, in this hack week, because uh, we had some discussions with Salt up upstream whether the implementation was right or not. And at the beginning, people were not very, the community were not very happy with some points. But in the end, they ended up accepting the uh, the pull request that was to there to to fix some uh, side issue. But uh, when I tried again, uh, it was not working, and this um, issue uh, showed up. Uh, the issue is that the sole bundle uh, that I got from the um, uh, Red Hat uh, tools uh, was not working anymore. Uh, we had a proof of concept uh, sole bundle that uh, our colleague Victor uh, shared with us, but uh, the, the binary uh, from the OBS uh, had uh, changed in December and unfortunately it was not working anymore. But I am confident that as soon as the sole bundle is, is working again, uh, we'll be back to the to the same status. And actually, as a reminder, what I tested uh, in the previous half week, onboarding, package installing, and uninstalling salt states formulas, everything was working. So uh, yes, we have a lot done here. Uh, there were a few things that we did not uh, test, such as the Prometheus exporter and open SCAP guides. And the documentation is already submitted and approved. Uh, it will be merged when uh, the release is official. Um, and what I said before, the client tools are the same that uh, the ones for EL8. Um, yes, regarding the availability at Uni, well, this is to be defined because uh, we are not very sure uh, about uh, when to release or whether to release it at all, or it depends uh, as well on the use cases and and community needing it or not. So this was uh, not a lot of the work of the hack week because the main work of the hack week was this one was adding support for uh, SUSE Linux Enterprise 15 SP5 and Open SUSE Lib 15 uh, 5. So and uh, you have the pull request here. Uh, the repositing was working, onboarding with salt, uh, the regular salt that we used to have before the bundle uh, with and without SSH, but also with the bundle and also for the bundle also for both cases, for with or without SSH. And um, the package install, uninstall, upgrade, patching, salt stays, formulas, remote commands, the documentation, everything was working and it was pretty easy to implement it this time. So if we go to the next slide, I think. No, that, that was all. Uh, yeah, so that one is for me. Yeah. If you have any question about uh, SLE, OpenSUSE or OpenOiler, I'm glad to answer to you. Otherwise, Julio, you can go ahead with your distributions. Yeah, for SUSE Linux Enterprise 15, SP5, and lib 15.5, remember what I told already at the first presentation, next version will include it because everything that Raul did for this is already merged, both the code and the documentation. Then my part was about OpenSUSE lib micro 5.3 and OpenSUSE micro OS. Um, both both are transactional operating systems, same as uh, the micro, so the Linux Enterprise Macro, 
micro, micro if anyone here already tested it, meaning that, well, there's a part of the file system that uh, it's, uh, let's say, frozen. And when you apply an update or a change there, you need to restart. But uh, the good thing about that is that you have the atomic upgrades. And then if there is any problem with the upgrades, you can easily roll back. Well, I, I'm using um, OpenSUSE Micros uh, for already, I think, two years on the same virtual machine for some continuous integration things. And it's something really, really interesting that you should you should try. But, but in any case, OpenSUSE Leap Micro 5.3 uh, is based on OpenSUSE Leap 15.4, while OpenSUSE Micros is based on Tumbleweed. The basic code and the documentation for all of this is already merged. So for OpenSUSE Leap Micro 5.3, repositing, onboarding, package installation, patches, salt states, etc., etc. All the basic uh, things are working. There are two things that I could uh, not fix on my own. One is that the formula we have to configure the locale, the well the time zone where the instance is, language, etc., etc., is broken at the moment. And then there is uh, some problem with uh, salt that prevents salt SSH minions with OpenSUSE uh, Leap Micro 5.3. For OpenSUSE Micro OS, things were a little bit more complicated because so because OpenSUSE Micro OS already has Salt 3005, and at the moment that is incompatible with the Salt version we get from the Unit Server, which is 3004. Problem should uh, should be fixed when we bump the server to OpenSUSE Elite 15.5. But still, in my opinion, the best option we have if we really want to at least show this as a proof of concept, would be having the bundle built for OpenSUSE Tumbleweed. So there is an issue. Let's see what we can do about it. And uh, well, in my opinion, it would be a very, very, very interesting use case because that would allow us to, to release this as a proof of concept or technical preview, call it what you want. But with that, we could test how stable or not OpenSUSE Tumbleweed is when managed by Uyuni, maybe it's better than, than I expected initially, and we can just have the bundle there working very, very stable. That's something we will need to see. So if anyone to, from the community wants to step in and uh, help with OpenSUSE Micros and Tumbleweed, then get in contact with us at Gitter or, or the mailing lists, and uh, our experts with, experts with Salt can give you some brief idea of how you can prepare this. But in any case, well, that means, as Abit already told, that we are, adding, we, we are adding more and more operating systems, and we intend to manage them all from a single, well, not a single unit server. If it is too big, maybe a too big installation, maybe you will need to use the hub. But in any case, as you can see here, and sorry, this slide is about SUSE Manager itself. I just reused it for the, for the community hours. But here you can see that we are not just focusing on SUSE and open SUSE systems, but for the last years, we were adding several Red Hat versions, Ubuntu, Amazon Linux, Alma, Rocky, uh, now, um, uh, sorry, Oracle as well. And uh, well, as they say, maybe the sky is the limit. So we plan to keep adding more operating systems. And of course, if the community wants to step in and add something else, then Feel free to give it a try. Feel free to ask for advice. In some cases, the changes, the changes are, that you will need are not that big. In some other cases, if the package format that the intended operating system is different, then you will maybe need to modify RepoSync, but everything is doable. So, well, that's it from me. We have a couple of minutes for questions, if you have any. Uh, I just have a, I just wondered if there was anybody who has tried uh, Amazon Linux 2022. It's in preview right now still, but it's based on Fedora 37. I just wondered if anybody's tried it. Seems nobody in the room. No. <laughs> yeah, but still, 
Donald, I think that's a very good question that maybe you should send that as well to the users mailing list. Okay. Because maybe someone already tried there. And of course, yeah, that is one of the new versions for existing operating systems that we will need to work on at some point. Very, very nice point. Yeah. Okay. Hey, then if there are no further questions, then I will jump to the next slot, which is from me again, one moment. And I will try to be very brief with this one. My other Hackwick project was about somehow being able to build the documentation for Uni on any operating system and with no, no tool change. So, yeah, well, not saying building the doc is hard, not sure how many people from this call already tried to build their Uni documentation, but it is, it, it is actually a bit hard because you have a full tool chain that is designed to be installed on top of only OpenSUSE or SUSE Linux Enterprise. It's a big list of software that you need to install with, well, NPM, GEM, CPAM, Zipper, changes you need to do on your local configuration for your bash RC configuration. If you are using a different terminal, I don't even know if that will work correctly. We use a lot of third-party dependencies that can break at any time if you have experience with NPM. M or gem, et cetera, et cetera. Well, sometimes it happens that a library gets retired or, or a library gets updated and then that causes a conflict with another library. You know, all the all the yeah, all the stuff. And then from time to time, of course, we need to update Antora and absolutely all the dependencies that uh, come with, with Antora. So for casual contributor for casual packages, uh, for anyone not using OpenSUSE or, or SUSE Linux Enterprise things can get complicated. And to be honest, it can, get, it can be complicated even for me from time to time. So while I'm not saying that the, contain the containers would be ideal for this, what I did was in fact an image for containers that basically has everything you need to build the documentation. And on top of that, for people not familiar with containers, I created a very small shell script, which works uh, as a wrapper, so you can call it, tell it, okay, here is my Git repository. This is the branch I want to use. Build the documentation for, for this uh, product. You can pick up system manager or uni and please speed out the, the outputs to this other directory. So you don't need to create any kind of mess in your systems. And as long as you can run bash and potman in your system, any operating system should work. And Yes, that could include macOS or even Microsoft Windows with the with double DSL, but I didn't try. So if someone from the community wants to give it a try and provide feedback, that would be great. And you won't need to worry about any tool chain changes. And in fact, my intention is that at some point we will deprecate the instruction the instructions to install it on your operating system. So I don't really have time time in this case for our demo, but here is the help from the wrapper. And as you can see, you can specify a product, comment to build, git repository, git reference, et cetera, et cetera. I recommend you give, a, give it a try later. And in fact, I will send an email to the lists explaining how this is working as well. The helper, the, this bash script helper that I described, well, allows you using a remote git repository or a, or a local one, if you are trying something locally works with Podman, I tested it with Podman, should work with Docker as well. I didn't try it. And if you are using a remote repository, then you can specify an output to get all the rendered docs. And even if you want, you can use the, the container to serve the documentation via HTTP so you can easily inspect it. If you use a local repository, then well, inside the local repository, you will specify local Git repository, you will just get your build into the build directory. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, so here you can see some scripts on how the wrapper is building the documentation after specifying some parameters. And after some time, you will just get the information of how you can check the documentation with a browser if you specify the, the right option or where you can find the build outputs so you can inspect them from there, 
package them and submit them with us, submit them with a request or update later the pull request, whatever you need. So you can get this project from the Uyuni project. Uh, sorry, you, you can get this, this, this thing from the repository at the Uyuni project. I will send the, the links later. And well, while I'm not saying we should use this thing for pull request, maybe it would be really nice to use it later and give it a try because, well, if I can publish the container in GitHub, for now it's public, published it at the Docker Hub, then we could use it to build the documentation on pull requests on demand. And whenever you are sending a pull request for the people to review, the documentation can get built automatically there for everyone to inspect the PDFs, HTMLs, or whatever you need. Because if you ever try to change the documentation, you will need you will know that changing as ASCII doc is fine. You can review the diff, but sometimes you really want to build things that to check that they are looking as they should. Um, so well, uh, here this last point is not updated. By the way, it tells that the doc squad should fix make help to show the real target. So you and get the real help. But thanks to Joseph, I think he, Joseph is not in, in this call. This is already fixed and you should be able to check the, the help for the different things you can do when building the, the documentation for Swiss Manager, for Uni, only PDFs, only HTML, et cetera, et cetera. So, well, as I told, I don't have much time to prepare a demo. I will send something to the mailing list so you can all inspect. I recommend that you all try and provide me feedback on how you can uh, expand this tool and see if it is useful for everyone. So I have a couple of questions, a couple of minutes for some, some questions. Otherwise, we can jump to the next slot. Ah, yeah, something I didn't remember to tell. If we have any translators in the room, then this can be very useful for you as well because you will be able to specify the git repository that comes from WebLate and check how your translations are looking when rendered. Oh, well, sorry, I was not looking at the chat in case there are some questions there, but yeah, seems not. So, well, in that case, Next presenter is Pablo. Go ahead, please. Okay, so give me a second to share my screen. This one here. All right. And now you should be able to see, hopefully, the slides. Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, so yeah, hi everyone. Uh, this is Pablo Suarez. Um, today I want to present you uh, some improvements that uh, I have done during the last hack week for the UniHealth Check tool. Um, all right, so this tool, just in case that you are not aware of this, um, this is basically um, a tool that is going to provide you some dashboards, metrics, and logs from a running Uyuni server in order to give you the health status from this Uyuni server. Uh, we wanted to make this not only to be able to run on a live Uyuni server, but also running from uh, the information that we can extract from a support config. Um, we want this to be really easy to run, container-based, and in the end, what this is doing is running Grafana, Prometheus, uh, Loki, and everything under the hood in order to be able to provide these um, dashboards and metrics. As mentioned, this was a project that we started, Cedric and I, on previous Hack Week, and during this last one, um, basically, the, yeah, we put some improvements there. Um, you have the proof of concept of this tool uh, inside the Uyuni project. There is a repository, there is a proof of concept Uyuni Health Check repo, where you can go there and look for this tool, um, give it a try. So basically the idea how this works, we have a Uyuni Health Check CLI. This CLI is our entry point. Um, 
and this can run directly on the running Uyuni server, or we can use the CLI to actually connect to a remote Uyuni server via SSH. In the end, uh, this tool will require that Podman is installed on your Uyuni server, since we are basically containerizing all the components that we need quite. Um, the tool will take care of building the different containers, downloading the images and setting everything up. In the end, our UniHealth check pod is created and we have the several containers here, um, which are actually exposing different ports uh, in our Uni server. Good, so just a brief uh, summary of what the containers are and what we are doing with them. So we have, um, the CLI, well, this is the main component, as mentioned, is the user interface uh, for the tool. We have one of the containers, which is the Eugenie Health Exporter. This container is basically exposing metrics uh, regarding the running Eugenie server. Metrics like, you know, last sold jobs, um, the times for processing different stuff, etc., and information from the database. We have Loki as well, which is the component that basically collects and process um, all the different logs that we are uh, incorporating here. Prometheus uh, for collecting the, metri like the, the metrics from the exporter, Grafana for providing the dashboard, and then Promptail and LogCLI, which are also the components related with the, the gathering process and query uh, process for, for, for uh, Loki. So the achievements during this last hack week, as mentioned, we have improved the README, the getting a start guide. Now it's really easy to start with. It was on the previous iteration, it was not really that easy. There were some problems building the Python package, etc., And there was still some manual steps that you need to do, but everything is now automated. So even the deployment of Loki, Prometheus, Grafana, and the dashboard is now uh, done by the, by the tool itself. The CLI for the tool has new commands and has been enhanced as well. Fix some memory leak that we found. And as mentioned, we put everything to run now on the same pod, so everything is yeah, more organized. How you can run this, how you can play with this. So yeah, as mentioned, you only need to install Podman and also pip, Python 3 pip in your Uyuni server. Uh, optionally, you can also install Python 3 virtual env in case that you want to install this tool inside your, your custom virtual env. You just check out the repository and then execute this pip3 install dot and that's it. You got it and then you can run the tool on your command line. This is an example how the help um, looks like for the tool. And now I wanted to give you a quick demo on this. So I hope you can see now a console. Um, this is one testing instance of a unit server. Um, and what we wanted to do here first is, OK, let's clone the repository, as mentioned. Let's go there. I have already Podman and pip installed here. So let's just run the installation, as mentioned. This would simply install the required dependencies and, and, and the, the Uni Health check package itself on our system or virtual env. This shouldn't take that much time. Let's see. And once this is done, okay, it should be there already. Good. So now we can simply have, or we can simply execute our tool. So, okay, people is asking to make the font a little big. Let me increase this a bit. I hope it is better now. So yeah, we have the help here. Okay, and as mentioned, if we want to run this for the first time, the only thing we need to do is to run the, to execute the run command. This would then, okay, I don't have the potman here, sorry. So let me just go to the fallback thingy where I have everything installed. So in this case, because I don't want to spend that many time um, running the, 
the, the, the building the, the, the images, I have another server here where we have this already around. Um, as mentioned, when we ran this, um, it would take care of creating the pods, um, which are already, and, and also building the images, which are already built. And then it would take care of, of um, spinning everything up. Everything is now ready. And then we get some result from the metrics. In this case, these are just a few metrics that we are currently collecting. Like for example, you know, the number of solve functions, uh, uh, the different solve functions that have been executed in the last 24 hours, uh, information about the Susemana, sorry, the uni uh, actions, pending actions, executed actions, and some stats from the running uh, solve master. And we also got uh, some summary of errors on different important files from the health, from the uh, perspective of our uni server. Um, as mentioned, once we execute this and the, con uh, the containers are then um, um, created, we can see the different containers running here. And as I mentioned to you, we are exposing um, the different com container ports to the um, uh, we are exposing the different container ports in the uni server so we can now access to the dashboard that we have for that we have deployed in this case let me just go here so if we access them to port 3000 which is the default port for the grafana then we will have a grafana instance where there is already a dashboard and this dashboard is basically exposing the same metrics that we saw in the command line, but here in a Grafana. Uh, yeah. It's all pretty. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the funny thing here is that, yeah, we can look for, you know, last whatever hours. And in the end, we have a good way to see and explore the different, for example, here, these are error messages that are detected here and we can uh, visualize them. We have an easy way to visualize the, the different errors and stuff that is happening on our logs in an aggregated way. So if we go seven days, uh, yeah, it would take some time. As mentioned, these initial metrics are, and that's for is kind of the, yeah, not really mature. It's just a proof of concept way. But in principle, we have all the different pieces already in place. So we can make these to to really uh, visualize the different metrics and even collect a lot of more metrics here. Um, and also, as mentioned, uh, vis a visual way to see what errors are happening on the different log files that we have, for example, here, cover, RHM file, salt. And then we can go directly and see, OK, this was repositing task issue, whatever. And we have an aggregated view of the different logs uh, sorted by timestamp um, here on Grafana. So that was it. Uh, sorry because of the stack trace that we just saw a moment ago, but this was a testing server that was probably not really uh, good enough. But yeah, um, so I invite you to give it a try, play with it, um, eventually even contribute to it. Um, so we can have as many metrics there. Um, yeah, there are commands also to clean all the different containers. So once I'm done and I want to destroy all these containers, I can simply run like this, and this will take care of stopping everything and drop every every containers. Um, so yeah. So yeah, if you have any question, um, yeah, I'm hearing you. Let me look also in the chat just in case. <laughs> Thanks, Donald. <laughs> yeah, the fancy finest Grafana dashboard. Okay. Um, okay, I see uh, Christian mentioning that Habit Health Chart or those in Docker Compose file for permanent installation could be useful for customers. Uh, again, this is yet only a proof of concept. We wanted to make it um to run with potman uh in order to make everything to work in containers which is more or less the path we are going um 
So, but we haven't yet think on how we are going to provide this. Uh, currently, it's a GitHub repository, that's it. But yeah, we have to start thinking uh, in case that we are making this also available, not only for as a proof of concept, but we also integrate this uh, as a normal tool for uni or eventually even for SUSE manager. So yeah, thanks for the feedback here. Definitely something to consider, yeah. Okay, any more questions? All right, seems not. Okay, so if with that, um... yeah. Thank you, everyone. I think there is no more question. If there is anything else, you can reach me uh, in a Slack or Gitter, and yeah, I'm uh, yeah, I will be more than welcome of providing any help or hints on this. All right, thank you. Yeah, very nice. And as I said, we told on the chat, feel free to add more data to it. So yeah, try to contribute. Okay. Yeah, Cedric. So hi everyone. Um, um, before going into into the de technical details of that thing, I want to tell to tell you about the uh, the use case. So why what is Fleet? What is Elemental? And why did I do that? Um, so Elemental and Fleet are two products that are uh, well. These are not even product. Two products. Uh, are developed by rancher people to automate cluster deployments, uh, Kubernetes cluster deployments, and deploying workloads on them. And uh, together with a few guys uh, at SUSE, and we had the idea: well, why not deploying the SUSE manager and, or a Uni proxy with this, so that we can just boot the machine and watch it watch it getting installed. Um, just as a spoiler, we succeeded. There are still some rough edges. Um, of course, Elemental and Fleet are not totally bug free. So there are still some, some things that are only working when they want. But it's globally pretty promising. So here um, is my rancher cluster. And you see, I have my uh, store uh, store proxy store proxy clusters here. So basically, the ID here is in the use case where a customer or user would have multiple locations like stores, where each of them has a proxy, and just to get them deployed automatically. And each proxy will get its own small cluster with just one node here, and then get the uni proxy uh, containers. This is done here in, uh, well, it, with the UI, I can show you how this happened, it, this works. So we have the OS management. And in the OS management, we have um, three things. We have registration endpoints, inventory of machines, and then clusters. And we need to define all three of them uh using yaml files that i'll show you later here i just have one registration endpoint that could be used for all installations all stores and this is pretty cool because it's generic and you get you create one iso image you plug that iso image on a usb key on your uh, your machine start the machine and everything starts up so what does it look like so this is a, a repository um, where I put the documentation and the YAML files I used. Um, so registration endpoint here contains a few things like what the, the root user of the, of the machine and where to install it. So here, these were virtual machines. I do, it just means install, uh, I think it's um, the micro for Rancher that is installed uh, on the main disk. So when you boot the image, first thing it does is installing it. The image is just um, one 
generic image with a configuration. And this configuration will call back to your uh, rancher. And there the, um, the proxy VM will know what to install and what to do. Um, here you see I have a sealed secret key so content. This is replaced on the fly while installing. So in order to store this, the Uyuni uh, generated SSL certificates and SSH keys for the proxy, I need uh, I store them encrypted using sealed secret. And I need to propagate the private key to each of these machines. So it's deployed here. Um, as a uh, K3S configuration file. And one of the magic that we uh, I'm using here is that I'm adding the serial number of the machine as a label uh, on, the, on the machine. And this is what will be matched later on. Um, see that now. So when we declare the... Um, this tool. We have a selector template and I will just match the machines by a serial number. Say uh, I want to, to get the machine that is having this serial number and this selector is used then on the cluster here to say that this will be the um, one of the machines for, my, uh, for use for my cluster. I'm just giving it the Kubernetes version I want. So I want to have K3S, this version. And I am also disabling traffic and service LB because in the documentation, if you already have seen that, uh, we document how to use it with a Metal LB to expose ports. And um, on the cluster, we define here the proxy IP and proxy of QDN labels. Uh, there is some magic that we'll see later on to use them di uh, directly there for the configuration. So these are basically the, the, the things that we saw uh, in the endpoint and the invent um, the cluster and the inventory of machines is basically the match between the machines and the cluster. So you'll see them popping them here and being associated while installing. So this was the elemental part. Once you have elemental um, doing its job, you have a, a running um, K3S cluster on your machine. But now we need to tell it to install the proxy. And this is done with fleet, which is called as continuous delivery here. And um, well, I have some troubles there. Maybe I broke broke up the setup. We'll see later. We'll see later. Um, in the continuous delivery, we define a git prox a, a git repo, and the git repo will be cut into multiple bundles, and these bundles are things to install. And every time you do a change, you push a change to that git repo, it will update the cluster. So my configuration is here. And you see, for instance, here, Metal LB will be deployed using this. So it's just a fleet.yaml file. And I'm telling it to use this hem chart. And um, these are just stuff I tell uh, fleet to ignore because they change every time. It's, it's not important if they change. And for the metal LB configuration, I, I created a, a very simple hem chart. And the hem chart here is just using a value, um, the IP as a value for the L2 pool. So this is coming from the documentation, basically, the uh, uni documentation. And then here is the magic that links it to the cluster label. So in fleet, when you use global.fleet.cluster labels, it means get the value from this label on the cluster. So this way, I just need to set the, uh, the label correctly on the machine, and it will be the same configuration for everything. Um, 
along these lines, so here we're deploying, pro we, we have a bundle to deploy proxy secrets, the, uh, no, the sealed secrets, sorry, for first, which is the thing, the thing that will be decrypting the secrets. We have the proxy secrets, and this is the interesting thing we want. So the certificate here is just a public key to, to, to encrypt them. And I have an overlay, which is a, a configuration that is specific to each cluster where I store the secrets and here the secrets are sealed secret. And they are, these are just the configuration files from, uh, generated by Uyuni that are encrypted with it. And then sealed secret will decrypt at runtime and they will be available for the, the, um, the containers. But on the Git repo, it's safe to store. And we have here in the fleet YAML, so we have target customization, say, uh, to ma matching some labels on our cluster and defining which overlay to use. And the last part is a proxy. Uh, so this is the config that YAML is generated by generated by the uh, unique uh, uh, uni server as well. I just dripped down the FQDN part because it's generic as well. And in the fleet configuration, so we give the uh, the OCI um, URL to, to the uh, ham chart. And these are data are, uh, this um, allow shared IP is just something that is in the documentation as well to have the same IP for TCP and UDP services. Here we use the uh, the proxy IP for the um, the load balancer IP and the FQDN. The proxy FQDN that you, is usually in the YAML file is defined here. Then tell it that this config YAML is a ham chart values, and we can even get values from um, the secret, the uh, Kubernetes secrets. I have a video of that. Um, I will not show it here because uh, we're already over time. Um, maybe I can post it somewhere. I'll check with Julio how we can do that. Do you have any question? Ned? So <clears throat> what are some next steps for this? Uh, concept well for me i have no next step um <laughs> i switched to something else for now uh, one of the interesting next steps would be to run to deploy multi-node clusters and to allow having uh, one shared storage across all these these nodes so that if one node fails then the uh, proxy container could con containers could be run on another one automatically. We're not there yet. It's not tested, but that would be awesome. This is good stuff. Thanks, Cedric. And yeah, thanks, Donald, uh, for better testing that thing. <laughs> and as for the video, Cedric, well, hope you can hear me. <laughs> yes, I can. Okay, good. Yeah, for the video, yeah, don't worry, everyone. We will publish YouTube. We can do it easily. And so I hope next week this is something we can do and then announce it that yeah, it's everywhere, Twitter, mailing list, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and if there are no more questions from Cedric, then a couple of uh, maybe closing remarks from my side. First thing is that, uh, well, to be clear about, clear about this, here at, uh, at uh, Susan Manager now, we are trying to make the Fridays free of meetings so we can focus on development and, well, or <laughs> release engineering in, in in my case, so we are going to propose the community changing the day of the uni community hours to some uh, some other date. Next week, I will be sending an email to the mail lists 
uh, with a poll that I think I will create with a GitHub discussion so everyone can vote and see what we can do about it. So of course, moving the unit community hours outside Friday is not mandatory at all. We will be counting on the on the community opinion, but we want your feedback and see what we can do about it. And then another poll that we will be having next week is, uh, well, since I mentioned that I'm going to publish this as a GitHub discussion, that means, of course, that now we have GitHub discussions and mailing lists at the same time, which is maybe a little bit overkill. So we want to check with the community which one of those systems you prefer to keep and which one you prefer to deprecate. So stay, stay tuned. I will send this to the devil and users mailing list. Well, and I guess announce the three of them. Uh, I guess I will publish it in Twitter, website, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So when you receive it, please participate and give your feedback. And with that, we are slightly bit over time, but still, I think that if someone wants to make any questions or briefly share some thoughts before we close the session, we can still do that. So floor is yours. Uh, just I have one one thing. So as you heard from Abid, I'm currently working on getting uh, a uni to run on RK2, probably also K3S. Um, next um, community hours will be already are already, already booked, so I will not be able to present it at the time. So that makes it in two months, but still, uh, as soon as I have something that is testable, I will send it to the mailing list and uh, I really hope to see feedback. Count on it. Very well, and since it seems we don't have any other questions or topics to discuss now, then yeah, it's 5.08 Central European time already. So yeah, I think uh, this session of the community hours was very interesting. A lot of different topics about the containers, operating systems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. As always, remember, well, not for the next session because as Cedric already told, everything, all the slots are already booked. But for April, we still have some empty slots. So if there is anything you want to present related in some in some way to Uni, just contact me. Gitter, mailing list, or wherever you prefer, and I can reserve a slot for you. And with that, well, I hope you enjoyed the session as much as I did. So see you next month. Happy hacking. Remember to have a lot of fun, and thanks for attending. See you next time. Thank you, Julio. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks, all. Bye, all. Bye.